All right, we'll just go ahead and get started because it's pretty close to nine. Um, so this is a portion of table 2.1 from your book, just with some acids and then their conjugate bases. Um, are there any questions before we get started on any of the um, acid-based stuff we did yesterday? <coughs> Okay, so um, the way, when you look at an acid-base chart, the things that are given from this side to this side, these represent a conjugate pair. So if the species is going to lose a proton, it'll go from the acid side to the base side. If it gains a proton, it'll go from the base side to the acid side. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me, I just picked HCl as one of the examples because it's um, one of the more commonly recognized strong acids. So as you go up this side, um, your acids are going to get stronger. So these are the strong acids. And then these down here are going to be weak acids. Okay. The measure of acid strength is the pKa. Okay. So Strong acids have very low pKa values. So they're typically less than zero. So they're all negative. Weak acids have high pKa values. <coughs> now for every acid that has a, with a conjugate base, the bases will have a pKb and the order will be reversed. So these will have, this would have a very high PK, or very low, excuse me, low PKB. This would have a very high PKB. And it's still measuring strength, it's just, or, and reactivity is just measuring base strength. But for the most part, these things are recorded, reported, and analyzed using a PKA value. Um, so the other thing to put on here is that if you have an acid that's very strong, its corresponding base is very weak. Okay, so the stronger the acid, the weaker its base. The weaker the base, the stronger the acid. Okay, so when you say that, <clears throat> strong acids have are reactive. And so this reaction is more likely to occur. If the acid is very reactive, then the corresponding base is not reactive. In the sense that this reverse reaction of taking a proton back doesn't happen. So if you have a reaction in which you have chloride in solution, it's not going to pull protons off of other components in the reaction. It may still do something, but it's not going to do acid and base chemistry with pulling protons away. So the things, <coughs> excuse me, that are strong bases, these are very reactive. Okay. which means if you write the same sort of, to go to this side, you have to lose a proton. To go to this side, you have to gain a proton. Now, this reaction is going to be the most probable reactive. So this is a deprotonated alkane. So this is a very strong base. The, high, the carbon atom does not want to have that lone pair. 
it'll grab a proton from wherever it can find one and it'll remake this alkane. So as you go down the list of acids, these become um, not reactive. So it's just the acid base um, reactivity and strength axes are inverted from one another. Are there any um, questions about acid base strength and how to identify a conjugate pair? Okay, I'm going to write out the list of the ones that you need to know in terms of the pKa values. And they won't be exact, but they'll be close. So the inorganic, they're also called mineral acids. So those are examples like HCl. So those are all the strong acids and there's seven of them. Those are going to have pKa values that are negative. Okay. Then the family of carboxylic acids, those are around five. If you need a specific number, it'll be given to you. Phenol, which is an alcohol, but it is connected to an aromatic ring that has a pKa of about 10. Water is right about 16. Other alcohols, these will be, you know, 16 as well. If you just want to memorize like negative 5, 10, 15, that'll be fine. Um, there's one at 20. Okay, ketones. So one of these here, that'll be at 20. And then <clears throat> you'll need, um, and alkane all the way up at 50. And we'll eventually use um, an alkyne, which is right over at home, 25, but you won't really need that one for a while. So these are the most important ones. So you should flashcard memorize these, put the name on one side and the PKA on the other. Okay, but for today, when we need them, I'll, I'll uh, give them to you. Okay. So, Make sure that if you don't have this list, um, it's back in one of the early emails I sent you right before the start of the semester. Okay. Questions about this and what you need to know? Okay. So what we're going to do now is move into section 3.3, which is called a quantitative Essentially, I, I'm summarizing here, quantitative analysis of acid strength. Okay. So you may not necessarily be given two acids right off the bat and asked which of them is the stronger acid. What you might be given is a set of conjugate bases. So we'll write here, consider the following conjugate bases. And they may not even be called conjugate bases. They may just say, consider the following bases. Okay. And so we're gonna have this one. So it's a diketone. So this carbon in the middle is carrying a lone pair and a negative charge, and there's a hydrogen not drawn. The other is just a ketone. So we have these two bases, and then the question is going to be, which base is stronger? 
Right? And when you say a base is stronger, it's going to pull protons more easily. So, <clears throat> excuse me, base strength is measured by pKb. You don't have pKb values. So what you need to do is you need to convert your bases to acids and then use pKa. Okay. So to convert the bases to acids, you're going to add a proton to both of these anions. And the proton's going to go at this point of negative charge. The proton doesn't have any electrons, so these two electrons and these two electrons will be used to make the sigma bond to that proton. So you make your diketone and then your regular ketone. Okay. Now from this point, now this is not one that you would have to memorize, but you could look it up and you would find that the pKa of this species is 9. The pKa of other ketones is about 20. That's supposed to be an approximate sign, but it doesn't look like it. There we go. Okay. So before you can analyze these two, you have to analyze these two. Okay. So what you're going to compare are these two numbers. The lower the value of the pKa, the stronger the acid. So this diketone is the stronger acid. This ketone is the weaker acid. Okay. The stronger the acid is, the weaker its base. The weaker the acid is, the stronger the base. So then your answer of which is the stronger base is going to be this one. <clears throat> Are there any questions about this example? Okay. Would you like to do one on your own or are you ready to move on? Could we try one on our own? Sure. Okay, so I'm going to just erase the molecules. Okay, so take a minute to take those anions and figure out which one is the stronger acid. Or, yeah. No, stronger base. Which one is the stronger base?
Okay, does anybody need more time? Okay, so in this, in these cases, um, the site where the proton will go will be the oxygen, or the uh, oxide, excuse me, um, because this is the point of negative charge and that'll attract a positive charge. So you would draw the conjugate acid. Here would be phenol, and this is acetic acid. Okay. And then these are both going to be able to be identified by the, this is the only example of phenol you have. Um, the pKa of phenol is about 10, and the pKa of uh, carboxylic acids is about five. So by comparing the numbers, this is the stronger acid. This is the weaker acid. So this is the weaker base. The phenoxide is the stronger base. So this would have been the answer to the question. Are there questions about these, this example? Okay, so the next thing we're going to do in section 3.3 is we can also use pKa or this quantitative analysis in order to predict the position of equilibrium. So for example, we've done this one before you did the arrows for it. So here's terse butoxide reacting with water to form terse butanol and hydroxide. Now, before you can predict the position, so left-hand side, right-hand side, what you need to do is you need to identify, <coughs> excuse me, the acids and bases in the reaction. Right. So if you look at what's happening and you read what's happening from right to left, left to right, excuse me. The terse butoxide, we can draw the arrows to show this, is going to have to pull a proton off of the water in order to make a protonated form, terse butanol and hydroxide. So the water here is the acid, it's the proton donor, which means the terse butanol is a base. A base is going to have a corresponding conjugate acid. An acid will have a corresponding conjugate base. Okay. So once you know where your acids are or which two species are your acids, you need your pKa values. Now, in this case, it's a little bit trickier. You'd have to be given specific values because we kind of have water and all alcohols lumped together. But the pKa of water is 15.7. So like I said, if you said 15 or 16, that would be fine. The pKa of terse butanol is 18. Now, this is... 
a very important last point, and this is going to tell you how to proceed. The reaction will always go from the side of low pKa to the side of high pKa. So pKa, remember, is a measurement of the probability of a reaction to take place. The higher the K value is, the more product favored a reaction will be. The lower the pKa, the more product favored the reaction will be. So since we're going to go from the side of low pKa to the side of high, this reaction will be right-hand side favored. Questions about that before we move on to qualitative analysis. Okay, so this is going to be section um, 3.4. Yeah, that's right. Three point four, and this is called a uh, qualitative perspective of acid base strength. Okay, so we just did quantitative. So quantitative data is numerical data. Qualitative data is analysis, like when you, when you describe things with non-numerical values. Okay. And if you have the slides, we're going to skip over the thing that says HCl versus um, uh, butane, and we're going to go right into the, um, it's a mnemonic, I guess, to describe the process of dealing with the qualitative perspective and then we'll practice. Okay, so the method that we use to analyze is called ARIO. Right. Now we'll talk about what the O is or I'll tell you what the O is, but this is going to be more important um, in Oh gosh, a later chapter. I can't remember which one it is. It's, I think it's chapter 10. Okay, so we won't really use the O for a, for a few more uh, weeks, another week or so. So what ARIO stands for, A stands for atom. Okay. And what that's asking you is which atom must hold the negative charge as a base. Okay, so when you take your acid and you deprotonate it, you make a base. And somewhere on that base, you have an atom that's being uh, required to hold on to a lone pair of electrons and a negative charge. Which atom is having to do that job dictates or plays a role in how strong of an acid or strong of a conjugate base you've made. R is going to stand for resonance. And what that's going to do is you're going to have to ask yourself, is the conjugate base or that negative charge that you just built on the atom is the negative charge on the conjugate base resonance stabilized? So the ability for a structure to um, 
delocalize electrons through resonance increases the stability. I is called induction. And what that has to do with is, um, is there a place or are, I guess it should be are there, are there. Are there other polar bonds in the molecule that can help stabilize charge. Because atoms really don't like to carry negative and positive charges as much in organic chemistry as they seem to be fine with it in general chemistry. Like sodium as a plus one cation is, is perfectly content. Um, but in organic chemistry, like carbons and stuff, they're not so happy having to carry a positive or negative charge, nor are nitrogens, oxygens, things like that. Now, what O means are um, orbitals. Oops, this pen is done. Orbitals. And all I want you to write next to orbitals is that some orbitals, are better at holding negative charge than others. Okay, so what the aerial method is actually going to do is look at features of the base. And when you can use features of the base, what you can do is you can ask yourself, is the base um, more reactive and less stable or less reactive and more stable? I'll be right back. I need to... Check something real quick. Okay, so Aereo will help us determine which kind of base we have, and then we can link that kind of base to the corresponding acid. Okay, are there any questions before? We're going to look at these things one at a time. Adam, well, they'll kind of build on one another, but we always start with the atom. Okay, so when we look at the atom identity, okay, we're going to do that in two ways and it's going to depend on, because we're always going to be comparing two things. So like, for example, if you say I have a strong acid, then it's, 
it begs the question, well, stronger than what? Weaker than what? So you're always making a comparison between um, molecules. So when we use atom identity and we're comparing two atoms, we have to figure out if the atoms are related in the same um, let's see, period, which would be uh, left to right across the periodic table, or if the atoms involved are in the same group, which would be up and down. Okay. So when we look at atoms in the period, the trend we're going to use to help us is electronegativity. Okay. So for example, if we take and I'm just going to draw one of these hydrogens for clarity. So this is propane. And we compare it to propanol. Okay. And we say that both of these are going to lose a proton. So these are our acids. And we're going to write underneath the conjugate bases. So the conjugate base of propane is a carbon ion, and here we have an oxide. So we have a carbon with a negative charge versus an oxygen with a negative charge. Electronegativity increases as you go across from left to right. So oxygen has higher electronegativity. Carbon would have lower electronegativity. Okay. The higher the electronegativity, the more stable the charge. Okay, so the oxygen carrying a negative charge is more stable than a carbon carrying a negative charge. Okay. So here's where then you have to kind of make um, a set of linked points. So the less stable the charge is, it means that particular species is more reactive. So this is a stronger base. This is the weaker base. The stronger the base, the weaker the acid. The weaker the base, the stronger the acid. So then you can pick which of these two things is going to be the stronger acid based on comparing the atom carrying the negative charge in the conjugate base. Kind of like watching a dog chase his own tail. You kind of start at one point and work your way back to that point. The questions about um, atom identity in a, in a period. Okay, let's look at atoms in a group. Okay, when you're comparing atoms in a group, you can't use electronegativity. Okay. Atoms in the group, you have to use size. Okay. And atoms get bigger as you go down a group. Okay. All right. So now what we'll take is water. 
and compare it to dihydrogen sulfide. So oxygen and sulfur are in the same group. Sulfur is bigger than oxygen. Okay. If both of these species lose a proton, then we end up with our negative charge on an oxygen and our negative charge on a sulfur. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare size. So oxygen is smaller, sulfur is bigger, okay? So oxygen has less surface area, sulfur has more surface area. Now remember, all of these electrons, these, this six and this six, they're all negatively charged. And so they're going to want to have as much of their own room as possible. So they're going to get more room in an atom with a larger surface area. So these electrons are going to be more crowded. These electrons are going to be less crowded. So the less crowded the uh, electrons are, the more stable they are. So this is going to be a more stable anion. This is going to be less stable. The less stable the anion is, the more reactive the anion is. This will be less reactive which means this is the weaker base, this is the stronger base. This then is a weaker acid. The dihydrogen sulfide is a stronger acid. And you don't need pKa to compare. Are there questions about atom identity before we move on to resonance? Okay. The second factor that you can use is resonance. Now you wouldn't use resonance until after you had used atom identity. Okay. And um, so what I mean by that is in this case, what we'll compare is ethanol to acetic acid. If both of these lose a proton, they're both going to end up with an oxygen atom having to carry a negative charge. So if you would start your aereo analysis, you would say, I have oxygen carrying a charge, oxygen carrying a charge. So atom identity isn't going to help you determine which of these two is more stable. But what you need to look out for is when you have a lone pair of electrons allylic or adjacent to a pi bond. So this is one of your patterns of resonance stability, a lone pair adjacent to a pi bond. So this species can distribute electron density over three atoms. Okay. 
this one has the like the negative charge has to stay on the oxygen you can't do resonance with this carbon because it has two hydrogens on it okay so more or the presence in this case more resonance means more stable so that's a more stable anion this is a less stable anion The less stable it is, the more reactive it is. This is going to be less reactive. Okay. So our less reactive base is going to be our weaker base. The more reactive base will be the stronger base. The stronger the base, the weaker the acid. The weaker the base, the stronger the acid. Okay, now this explains why these pKa values are about 15 and this pKa value is about 5. Okay, so the impact of resonance increases the acidity by a factor of 10 to the 10th power. So this species here is 10 to the 10th more re, more acidic that's a lot more acidic than ethanol okay. there are questions about resonance All right, the last one um, in this section that we're going to do, like I said, we're going to keep um, the orbital out for a little bit. Um, so the third factor is induction. And I don't know why they use the word induction when really it's just referring to bond, polar bonds. They could just say bond polarity, but they don't. They use a fancy word induction so what we have to um, what we're going to compare here now is acetic acid versus trichloroacetic acid so instead of these have hydrogens here on this CH3 group but over here they're chlorines Okay, so this thing is just acetic acid. This is trichloroacetic acid. So there's two that are missing in this trend. So this is an extreme that has zero halogens. This is an extreme that has three. So you could have monochloroacetic acid, dichloroacetic acid, trichloroacetic acid. All right, so in both cases, you take the proton off. And you end up So I'm going to draw this a little bit differently. Um, well, no, I won't. I'll just do CL, CL. Right. So induction is the third thing. So we start with atom identity. Both of the uh, deprotonated um, species have a negative charge on an oxygen atom. So since these are the same atom, the atom identity can't be used to um, tell you which of these is the more uh, or the stronger acid. Not going to draw the resonance structures, but I'll draw the resonance arrows. This is resonance stabilized, as is this species, resonance stabilized. So they would both have a second resonance structure. So resonance isn't going to, do, to um, separate these two species. Okay. 
what you have to look for in this case are bond dipoles or the inductive effect. So all of these bonds from the carbon to the chlorine are polar towards the chlorine. Okay. So what that's going to do is it's going to make that carbon that's in the green partially positive. Okay. More so, far more so than this one. So this having this neighboring carbon partially positive means it's like you get an extra atom that can help stabilize charge. So you get an extra stability effect by having these polar bonds. Now, if you had monochloroacetic acid with only one chlorine, it would still do this. It would still inductively help stabilize the resonance structures, but it won't help as much as having two chlorines or as much as having three chlorines. So it's an additive effect. So this is the more stable anion. This is the less stable anion. Less stable means more reactive, which means it's a stronger base. Okay. More reactive means less stable. Wait, wait, wait. More stable means less reactive. Sorry, I got that wrong. That's a weaker base. The weaker base is related to a stronger acid. A strong base is related to a weaker acid. So the presence of those chlorines increases the strength of the acid. Okay. Are there questions about um, this? I feel like we're flying through this chapter, which is good. Okay. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at, and depending on when you took general chemistry and how much focus was given to this, we're going to move into section 3.9, which are called Lewis acids and bases. Lewis acids and bases is the most inclusive definition of acids and bases that we have. So there's three definitions. The first is the Arrhenius model. The second is Bronsted-Lowry. The third is Lewis acids and bases. So the first two monitor protons and hydroxides. Lewis acids and bases, this model monitors electrons or an electron pair. Okay. Since the Lewis model is the most inclusive, anything that is a Bronsted-Lowry acid and base is also a Lewis acid and base. Okay. So all Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases are Lewis acids and bases. But not all Lewis acids and bases are Bronsted Lowry acids and bases. So when you use the Bronsted Lowry method, or so, excuse me, the electron the Lewis method and you monitor electron pairs, what you have on your acid is it must have an empty orbital. Okay. 
So examples of things with empty orbitals are things like protons. So a proton has an empty 1s orbital. Um, aluminum in aluminum trichloride has an empty, I'm trying to think real quick, 3s orbital. Okay, so Lewis acids can be metal cations. Okay. The base has to have a lone pair. And what happens is the base donates electron density into the empty orbital. And this forms an A to B sigma bond. So Lewis acids are all electron pair acceptors. Lewis bases are electron pair donors. So when you use the words acids and bases, by default, you're speaking about Lewis uh, bronze lauri acids and bases. If you want to talk about the Lewis model, you have to call them Lewis acids and Lewis bases. You can't just call them acids and bases. Okay. The reason why this is so important is that it allows us to talk about chemical reactions as acid-base reactions, even if they don't involve the transfer of a proton. We just have to monitor electron transfer. So we're going to look at two different examples um, of reactions, both of which can be described by the Lewis model, but only one can be described by the bronsted lori model. So the first one is just to take a ketone. and we're going to react it with hydronium. And don't worry if you don't understand why this reaction takes place right at this minute. We, we could do the analysis with the um, pKa's um, there in that table if you wanted to. But what happens in this reaction is that you have a proton transfer. So the electrons on the ketone oxygen or the carbonyl oxygen take a proton and you make this protonated ketone plus hydroxide. Okay. So this is a Bronsted-Lori model or Bronsted-Lori definition because we have proton transfer. But it's also Lewis model because we're using a lone pair of electrons on an atom that has an empty or empty-ish 1s orbital because the electron density in this bond is being pulled towards the oxygen. So this partially positive hydrogen has a pseudo-empty 1s orbital. So those two electrons go into the empty orbital, making a new sigma bond. So this is the new bond. And then, oops, I did that wrong. This is supposed to be water. There we go. Great. Now the second example is gonna still involve that ketone. But now what we're going to do is we're going to react it with boron trifluoride. Now, boron is an atom that is satisfied when it sees six valence electrons. So two, four, six electrons around the boron. They are very reactive compounds because boron would like to have eight valence electrons, but these are stable. Okay. But there's an empty orbital 
on the boron because it's not seeing an octet. So this electron pair can be donated into the empty orbital on the boron. Now in this case, you're not going to break anything off. You're going to end up with a species that looks like this. And like I said, don't worry that these products look weird or don't know where they, why that would happen. I'm just telling you it does. All right. Are there questions about anything from chapter three? I do have one slide that I need to pull up from the um, notes on Canvas before we move into chapter six. I'm going to find that other slide. I have a quick question. Yeah. What kind of question or how would it be worded on the test if we were asked about the, the would, it, would we just be clarifying like this is a Bronsted-Lowry or this is a Lewis? That's Ask one way. Okay. Like we've asked questions in the past, like which of the following is a Bronsted-Lowry acid, but not a Lewis acid. So a Bronsted-Lowry acid would have to be a proton donor, but a, but a Lewis acid just has to be an electron pair acceptor. So you don't need a proton for the Bronsted-Lowry model, uh, excuse me, the Lewis model. Okay. So does that make sense? So yeah. here's a good example. Like these are so the Lewis acid is the is and model is the best way to go about organic chemistry because it also incorporates all the bronsted lowry um, acids. But if you look up here, there here are some proton donors. So you can see things like HCl, HBr, HNO3. Those are all proton donors, which means they could be described by the bronsted lowry method. Carboxylic acids, phenols, and this alcohol. Okay? But all of those hydrogens that are in red are polar and are um, partially positive in these structures, which means their 1s orbital is empty or mostly empty and therefore they're also Lewis acids. But you can have Lewis acids that don't have anything to do with protons, they just have empty orbitals. So a lithium cation has an empty 2s orbital, magnesium has an empty 3s orbital, aluminum, and they're all these chloride compounds where you have these metals that have empty orbitals that'll accept electron density. So it's like saying not all, I mean, not all thumbs, fingers are thumbs, but I don't, I don't know. Sorry, I should not make up stuff while I go along. There's a saying about like how things are related and not. So all of these are Lewis acids, this whole group, but only a portion of them are also Bronsted-Lowry. So these are Bronsted-Lowry and Lewis. These down here are only Lewis We're, um, acids. So now if you look down here though, you see a lot of duplication. So if this proton is taken from an alcohol, then the alcohol is going to act as a Lewis acid. But if the electrons on the oxygen go and grab an atom, then the alcohol is acting as a Lewis base. So you're going to see things in both categories. And it's just going to be based on how that particular species acts in a reaction. So even something like a carboxylic acid can, in some circumstances, act as a Lewis base. So the only reason I'm showing you this is because you need to know some of these compounds and cations that act as Lewis acids. You need to see that the Lewis acid grouping has a large group 
So all of these, oops, excuse me, all of these are Lewis acids, but then there's a subset that are Bronsted Lowry acids. And then it's to say, depending on what atom functions in the reaction, a specific molecule like ethanol can behave as a Lewis acid or a Lewis base, depending on the reaction it's participating in. Okay. Are there any questions before we move to chapter six? So up until this point, we've been doing a lot with just like individual molecules, figuring out their name, stereochemistry, conformation. Um, now what we are going to start doing is talking more about reactions. Um, so chapter six is like um, an introduction to chemical reactions and then we'll start really seeing mechanisms in um, chapter seven. Um, put my box. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so one of the things that is uh, uh, with chapter six, the first part of it, sections 6.1 to 6.5 are going to be mostly self-review. Okay. So 6.1 to 6.5, it's going to be mostly self-review of kinetics and thermodynamics. So your exam next Monday covers chapters three, five, and six. So this material is testable on Monday. We'll cover it in more detail and use it for our reactions when we get into chapter seven. But like you should have a basic understanding of thermodynamics and a basic understanding of kinetics from doing this review. And there's stuff on Alex that'll help you with that. And I'm always well happy to answer questions, um, but we're going to, I'm gonna pull most of that information into seven. Okay. So where we're going to start is we're going to start talking about the fact that there are two ways in which bonds break. or are made. Okay. The first is called homolytic. Okay. The um, prefix homo means the same. So when we're talking about uh, bond breakage, it means that the same thing happens on the left as what happens on the right. Okay. So we're going to get a symmetric bond break or we'd get a symmetric bond formation. All of these reactions move single electrons at a time. So we use what are called fish hooks. We make radicals. And these are chapter 11 reactions. Okay, so there's very little that you're going to do with this until probably the last week of class. Okay. What we're going to do most of 
the class and most of organic chemistry is done in this way is to use a heterolytic pathway. So when you have a heterolytic, hetero means different or asymmetric, both of the electrons go to one of the atoms and you end up making ions. Okay. If you want to have your ions reform a compound, you have to use a double barbed arrow to go from electrons to the positive charge. Because we make ions, we're going to call these polar or ionic reactions. Okay. This is most of what you're going to be doing for the rest of the class and even into 211, or sorry, 212. So this is chapters six through 10, and then you and 12 pretty much. And then this is chapter 11. All right. So we're going to take this ionic reaction and we're going to talk a little bit more about how ionic or polar reaction mechanisms work. So this is jumping all the way to 6.7. Okay, and we have to introduce some new terms called nucleophile and electrophile. All right, so these need to be on flashcards because we're going to use the terminology electrophile and nucleophile to discuss our polar reaction mechanisms. Okay, so all polar reaction mechanisms these you will always see ions involved you will always use a double barbed arrow You will always move electrons either from a pi bond or a lone pair to things that carry either a partially positive or a full positive charge. Okay. So the golden rule in, in organic chemistry is negatives attack positives. Always. It's never in the reverse. Negative and the word attack, that's just the way it's always been described. So negative things attack positive things, okay? Positive things never attack negative things, okay? So what we really have is we have species A, which is the thing that'll be negatively charged, and species B, or sorry, the negative thing which will have electrons will attack something that's positive or partially positive. So we have two different things in our reactions. Okay. So now we can define the nucleophile. So the word nucleophile, file means to love. So this word means to love a nucleus. Okay. The nucleus 
is positively charged. So nucleophiles love to find positive charges. So your nucleophiles must have a lone pair of electrons They can be neutral or negatively charged. Okay. So your arrow tail starts here. So your nucleophiles will have the tail. The tail, remember, is this part. The other thing is your electrophile. Okay, again, file means to love electrons which are negative. So an electrophile loves things with electrons. Nucleophiles have electrons. Okay. Electrophiles are going to be partially positive or full positive charged species. Okay. These things are in need of electrons. Okay, so nucleophiles are electron rich. Electron, electrophiles, excuse me, are electron poor. Okay, so rich things donate to poor things. The arrowhead will go here. And what we would say is that a nucleophile will attack an electrophile by donating electron density. Let me write that down. So nucleophiles, NU is the shortcut for saying nucleophiles. Nucleophiles attack electrophiles. There's really not a good abbreviation for that. Attack nucleophiles. And I forgot what I was going to say. And they, oh, they donate electron density. Okay. So we're going to look at electrophiles and nucleophiles in a little bit more detail so we can start identifying which thing does which job. Okay. Other questions so far? Okay, so we'll start with nucleophiles. So nucleophiles are things that are electron rich. And they have the ability to donate a pair of electrons. Okay. So things that donate a pair of electrons are also Lewis bases. So Lewis bases are always nucleophiles. 
and you're going to look for three things. You can have atoms with lone pairs. And that species can be neutral. So we would write that NU with a pair of electrons. It's not charged, it's just a neutral species. Okay. You can have atoms with lone pairs of electrons that are negatively charged. So we would write that NU electrons negative. Okay, so all the, di the difference between these two is really in the strength of the nucleophile, how quickly it can attack something that's positive. But um, an example would be here, you could say the water atom has a lone pair of electrons on the um, oxygen, but water is neutral. So it could be a nucleophile. Or we could say, we have hydroxide, which has a lone pair of electrons and a negative charge. Both of these are nucleophiles, but they're not going to be the same kind of nucleophiles. This would be a stronger nucleophile because it has a charge. This one would be weaker. Okay. And the third thing you're going to be looking out for is um, molecules with pi bonds. They can donate pi electron density. And the reason that happens, you kind of have to go back to the structure. So if we draw um, ethylene, remember it has a sigma bond between the carbons, but then it also, since it's sp2 hybridized, it has parallel p orbitals that can laterally overlap to make the pi bond. So pi bonded electrons are above and below the molecule. Okay, because this is trigonal planar. It's a planar molecule because the carbons are sp2. But on the top and the bottom, you have this pi bond, which means these pi electrons are less tightly held. If they're less tightly held, they can be easily donated. Are there any questions about um, nucleophiles? Does anybody need this screen up longer? Electrophiles. Okay. So electrophiles are going to be species that are electron deficient. And are able to accept a pair of electrons. Okay. So a pair of electrons, if you can accept an electron pair, 
you're a Lewis acid. Okay, just seeing where we're going. Okay, so for electrophiles, you're looking for two different things. Okay, you're either looking for atoms with a full positive charge like a carbocation or a hydrogen cation, but carbocations, or you're looking for atoms um, in polar bonds. If you have an atom in a polar bond, it will carry a partially positive charge. Okay, so there's just a difference between being a full positive and a partial positive. So if we look at one chlorobutane, the carbon atom attached to the chlorine is in a polar bond, and the bond dipole is pointing towards the chloride or the chlorine. So this carbon is partially positive. Okay. So if you had to pick on this compound where the attack would occur, it would occur on the carbon in the polar bond. In this case, it would be on the carbon carrying the charge. Any questions on those? Okay, could you guys go, because we're gonna, uh, well, let's, re let's, I'm gonna do a summary table and then I'm gonna ask you guys to do a poll. We're going through this um, faster than I thought and six is gonna be the last of the stuff on the exam. So um, I have a question for you after we finish. Okay, so, you, there's a chart that you can use to kind of sort of help with nucleophiles versus electrophiles. And the only reason I'm going to take the time is there's a couple examples in here that are um, kind of weird, especially in the nucleophile. So electrophiles, again, have to have a partially positive carbon or a partially positive atom as a result of a polar bond. Or you have to have a full positive charge like on a carbocation. And in this case, you would have an empty P orbital. Okay, because carbocations are sp2 hybridized and trigonal planar, so they're flat. And so they have an orbital, a lobe on the top and a lobe on the bottom. Now, one of the things that you can do is, and, and it reverses the polarity. And so some metal atoms, like lithium and magnesium, they do bond to organic molecules. Okay. But when they do so, they make the carbon partially negative. So the bond dipole is reversed. Metals are less electronegative than nonmetals. So the trend is gonna be in this direction. Okay. So then that carbon is a little bit negative and could act as a nucleophile. Again, you have lone pairs of electrons on neutral atoms or lone pairs of electrons on charged atoms. And the last thing that you can use for your nucleophiles are pi bonds. Okay, so before we move on, and we, will, we are gonna move on a little bit farther today, but if you could go in your participants poll and um, 
maybe we'll have to, I'll ask this again um, tomorrow. A lot of it depends on where you are in your reading. So how comfortable are, are you comfortable with me having the first half of this chapter completely self-study? You can say yes or no, and I don't, and you're not going to offend me. Well, that's a lot of no's. Okay. So what we'll do, and because I think we have enough time to be um, with chapter seven, especially since that's not tested for another while. So we'll finish six and then we'll go back and start six and we'll just do a quick um, kinetics and thermodynamics review um, for the stuff that's really important. And then you'll see it again then when we move into seven. So maybe even switch in the order is not a terrible idea, but we will go back and do that. That's fine. So I'll, let me just write a note and we'll just do a review of thermal. Okay, perfect. Glad I asked. Okay, um, all right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move into section 6.8. And this is called characteristic patterns uh, of reactivity. Because most organic reactions are just some variation on the order in which these patterns occur. So the first pattern or predictable um, reactivity, and we're going to use arrow pushing to show this, is called a nucleophilic attack. Okay. And that would be where a nucleophile attacks an electrophile. So nucleophile attacks. I'm just going to write electrophile, EL. The second characteristic pattern is called loss of a leaving group. Okay. So the shortcut for writing that will be minus LG. Okay. So a leaving group is a part of a molecule that breaks off or leaves the parent molecule and is stable once gone. Okay. So this idea of being stable once it's gone is going to relate to conjugate base stability. Okay, so for example, if chloride breaks off of HCl, hydrochloric acid, and is stable, then if chloride breaks off of an organic molecule, it's also going to be stable. So stability is a property of that chloride anion. The third step, or the third pattern, is called a proton transfer. Okay. Now, the weird thing about proton transfers is that they look a lot like nucleophilic attacks. But your textbook, so therefore you, have to distinguish if something is a nucleophilic attack versus whether it's a proton transfer. So if there's a proton involved, it's proton transfer. If there are not protons involved, it'll be nucleophilic attack. Okay. And that's pretty self-explanatory. You just move a proton. The fourth pattern is called rearrangement. And what rearrangement does or is, is you have a species that shifts atom placement
to create a more stable species. Okay. It's not on its own a reaction. It's a step within a reaction. So you, it's like you, you're going to create something and then you have to look at it and say, is this the most stable form of this species I can make? Or can the molecule move little bits and pieces around to make something more stable before the reaction finishes? Okay. So this is what we're, where we're going and we'll start up at the top with nucleophilic attack. Okay, other questions so far? Okay. So nucleophilic attack. Okay. So in a nucleophilic attack, remember you have to have a nucleophile and it must have a lone pair it can be neutral or negative in terms of charge. It can't be positive. Sometimes you're, you can use one arrow to show this. Sometimes you have to show more than one arrow to show this. And that's going to depend on whether or not your nucleophilic attack would violate the octet at a specific atom. Okay. So for example, if we take a bromide anion okay, and we put it into a system that has a carbocation. Okay. Now in general, bromides are fairly stable, but negatives will attack. This carbon is so in need of two more electrons that this reaction will take place. Okay. You always start on electrons and you go to positive points. So you can start on any set of electrons and move to that positive center. Okay. That's going to make a sigma bond. So your product is going to have a bromine now bonded to that carbon that had been fully positive. So this is that new sigma bond. Now in this case, our nucleophile has lone pairs and a negative charge. Okay. Negative and positive makes this side neutral. This side is neutral. So you have to maintain charge balance throughout the course of your reaction. Okay, now in this case, and again, you, I'm not asking you to predict the products. I'm just going to tell you this product prediction is pretty straightforward. This one is not. Okay. In this case, what will happen is this lone pair of electrons is going to attack this partially positive carbon because the bond is polar towards the oxygen, polar towards the chlorine. Okay. So it's going to come in and attack here and this is going to make a sigma bond. Okay. But if this is all that I do, I'm going to end up with five bonds to that, that carbon and that can't happen. So you can always move a lone pair, or sorry, a pi electrons to a lone pair. Okay. So what you're gonna make, I'm gonna move the, shift the organization here a little bit. This species. So this is just showing the nucleophilic attack. This thing is going to further react. But for right now, it's fine how it is. Okay. This side is neutral. This was a neutral nucleophile, a neutral electrophile. 
this is has two ions in it, but plus one plus minus one is neutral. So if you saw this written out, you have to be able to recognize that it's a nucleophilic attack. We have time for one more, so we'll do loss of the leaving group. So we're going to do the reverse of what we just did. Okay, so we start with a carbon that's bonded to the bromine. This bond is polar towards the bromine. Okay. Loss of a leaving group. Halogens, with the exception of fluorine, are very good leaving groups. Okay. So the bromine is going to leave, but it takes electrons with it. Leaving groups always take electrons. Okay. And what you would form then would be your carbocation and the bromide anion. Okay. Now you can say, well, how do you know that the bromine is going to leave and not the CH3? Okay, so you could say, you could do an analysis and say, well, which of these is more stable? Oops, can't see that, sorry. Okay, well, so these would both be conjugate bases. They're acids. are a strong acid with a pKa that's negative or an alkane with a pKa that's 50. So this is the stronger acid, so this is the more stable conjugate base. So you can predict which group will leave your compound. Okay. Now this next one is just, it's a big compound because uh, I wanted to show that there are a few ways to picture this. And it was a good example from the book. But you have to draw a lot of stuff. So you have a nitro group at the top, a diene on, so diene means two alkenes, a diene on in the ring, and then you have a chlorine and a hydrogen, hydroxide. Okay, so our leaving groups are either a chlorine or a hydroxide. So you could do this right away to predict which one is the leaving group. Okay, so if you break a chloride off, it's related to HCl. If you break off a hydroxide, it's related to water. This has a pKa that's less than zero. This has a pKa equal to 15. Stronger acid, more stable conjugate base. So the chloride is going to be the species that breaks off of this compound. Now you can either break the chloride off and then allow the electrons to um, reorganize to, to manage that um, carbocation charge here or you can move the electrons first and like push the leaving group off. And that's sort of the way I view it. These electrons would come down. These electrons would pi bond to pi bond, pi bond to pi bond and kick off the chloride. Okay. What you would end up making then Oops. Is this like that? 
as two separate species. Okay. Now, you might be like, thinking, how do you know this? Okay. You don't have to worry about that right now, but if, if you saw this and you saw this, you need to be able to do two things. Classify it as loss of a leading group and draw the arrows on this structure that would make these two structures. Okay, so right now product prediction is at its very, very beginning stages. Okay, so don't panic about the products right now. Okay, so let me see what we have coming up next. So we have, okay. So it won't take me long tomorrow, to, tomorrow's Thursday, to finish six and finish what I plan to do for six and do a little thermo and kinetics review. And then we'll start seven and um, we'll be in good shape. But it would really help me and help you if, tomorrow, if by the time you come back tomorrow, you will have read 6.1 to 6.5 in the textbook because then some of the stuff you may pick up and then the little bits that we have to fill in won't take quite as long. Are there any um, questions before we go? Okay, sounds like a no. So I will plan to see you guys tomorrow. Have a good rest of your day. It looks pretty out. So I will see y'all tomorrow. Thank you for class. Yep, you're welcome. Have a good day, everyone.